we're all set, Neil, if you we're ready when you are. Um, so I'll make the introductions if that's all right. So um, hello and falcha or welcome uh, everyone. My name is Ahmed and I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar on retching or gagging in dentistry hosted by the Irish Society for Disability and Oral Health. It's our first of a series of webinars who are running uh, through the next couple of months. Um, uh, but uh, it just so happens that it's not the first event of the evening um, related to special care dentistry in Ireland. I'm aware Professor Blana Daly uh, presented her inaugural lecture in Trinity College Dublin earlier to this evening. Um, to So I, I hope that some of you were lucky enough to um, attend as well. Um, regarding this webinar, we've received a huge amount of interest um, and specifically it speaks volumes to how often we're faced with the challenge of patients who do have uncontrolled gagging or retching um, in our practice that inhibits our treatment of them. Um, and thankfully, we are grateful to be joined by Dr. Neil Martin, a specialist in special care dentistry with us. Um, and just before I complete my introductions, um, I just a couple of housekeeping. So the first thing is the Q and A button that you will see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we would like this and Neil would like this as much as possible to be interactive and conversational, um, just to keep things more interesting um, because there's a huge amount of experience um, of our attendees. And I think sharing your own ideas, your own tips and your own thoughts on what Neil will be speaking about will be quite useful as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to raise it up in the Q&A tab and I can ask it um, periodically throughout the presentation. And again, I would highly encourage you to engage using the chat function um, that you see on the menu at the bottom. Um, there will also be a couple of polls throughout to encourage everyone to kind of maintain the interactivity and also to give Neil an idea of where everyone comes from and their background. Um, for anyone who has a salient point to raise, um, you can pop your hand up if you'd like. Uh, feel free to do so at any stage as well. Again, we want to keep this um, interactive and conversational. So if you do want to speak up, just you can press the raise hand button and, uh, and I'll put you through to Neil. Um, and there is a closed captioning function as well that I see some of you have already started to use. Uh, it's quite useful. Um, it helps. To, obviously, we need to kind of um, facilitate these kind of services in the kind of work that we do wherever we can. And this is one example of it. Um, but back to our presenter this evening, um, Neil. So. Dr. Neil Martin is a specialist in special care dentistry, and he has spent 40 years in dentistry, 10 in practice and 30 in special care. His main interests are uh, the local anesthetic and sedation of patients, um, and also in coaching and mentoring of his junior colleagues. So Neil, without further ado, if you can take it away, please. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so I'm ready to go. I have my cup of Barry's tea here just to keep me refreshed as well. So uh, I think the first thing we'd like to do is uh, go with the first poll, if we could, Ahmed, and uh, just let's see where everybody's uh, watching from. Sounds good. I'll give everyone just a couple of minutes to to pop their backgrounds in one more person there we go
Okay, let me share the results here for you, Neil. Okay. Well, excellent. So, uh, good evening, Ireland. Good evening, Middle East. I suspect that might be Egypt. And uh, hello, UK. Um, I'm just curious, uh, my town, Northampton in England, uh, has many people from Mayo in it, um, particularly Bell Mullet. I just wonder, is there anybody from Mayo tonight uh, tuning in? If there are, just put it up in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll say hello to you. OK, so we can close that, Ahmed, and we'll uh, start the presentation. OK. So, Ahmed, I'm... Okay, so the title of this talk is Doctor, I think I'm going to throw up, and the objectives of it are to look at the anatomy and physiology involved, and to investigate the triggering factors, and to suggest some treatment strategies. So evolution has given us a retroflex effectively to prevent food entering the airway, because it's a very complex part of your anatomy, and what we don't want is food entering your larynx and destroying delicate lung tissue. So it's defined as a rhythmic respiratory movement against a closed glottis. Prolonged retching can lead to vomiting, and the definition of vomiting is forced expulsion of the upper gastrointestinal contents. So if we move on, um, and let's say the definition again, a rhythmic respiratory movement against a closed glottis. And it's got lots of synonyms, dry heaving, gagging, retching. I think the point is that the patient doesn't bring anything up, whereas um, there's no expulsion of the stomach contents. Prolonged retching can often lead to uh, vomiting, however. And we'll talk a little bit about vomiting later. So... The oral pharyngeal area is involved in a lot of things, feeding, chewing, swallowing, speech and respiration. And there are two reasons you may gag. There is a physical trigger, a somatogenic one, uh, a mental stimulus, a psychogenic one, or it can be a combination of both. So as dentists, we don't normally work at the back of the mouth, but there's a lot of trigger points at the back of the mouth, at the uvula, the fauces, the pharyngeal wall. And the second most important area to us as dentists that can trigger retching is the palate, but by far and away, the most important area is the dorsum of the tongue, that area there. And we'll talk quite a lot about that later. So in special care, we do seem to have a lot of patients who have particularly large tongues. So if you get a special care patient that retches, it's quite easy to touch the tongue and start a retch reflex. So when do patients retch? Well, there's a variety of reasons for this. Pills and tablets, I'm sure many of you uh, watching tonight probably can, will heave when you try and swallow some of the enormous sized tablets that seem to be dispensed these days. I uh, had an oncology patient the other week who had mucositis and was having extreme difficulty trying to swallow their medications and was retching as a result. Food poisoning, um, if you eat bad food, you can retch and that's probably a safety reflex. Exercise, if you exercise on a full stomach after a meal, that can cause you to retch and eventually be sick. Gastroesophageal reflux disease. Pregnancy, you get changes in your hormonal level and blood pressure can cause you to retch. Cough, and particularly with COVID and COVID coughs, people cough and cough and cough and eventually they start retching and then sometimes they can vomit after that. And stress, stress can affect the gastrointestinal system central nervous system and cause dry heaving or retching. And of course, when patients retch, at the dentist, and probably that's why we're all here tonight. So how does retching affect patients at home? Well, it prevents good oral hygiene. You can see there, there's a retching patient. They're not able to brush particularly well. Um, one tip I was told was don't use really cold water, use warmer water, and you can experiment with different toothbrushes. If you've got any hygienists attending tonight, Maybe you'd like to put in the chat box some suggestions as to how a retching patient might improve their oral hygiene at home. Be interested to see if there is anybody that can uh, submit that. So how does it affect patients at the dentist? And it's severely embarrassing for the patient. Um, 
quite often we don't really realize that patients can be really embarrassed at the dentist and we just sort of say oh, pull yourself together and get on with it but it can be very embarrassing there's a paper here um the contribution of embarrassment to phobic anxiety a research study so you know we have to be sensitive we have to have a good relationship uh, with our patients we need good rapport and you need to take the problem seriously and you need to develop patient confidence and often with retching patients it's the building of a strategy over time there's not an instant solution. So the three main offenders uh, for retching, first of all, uh, x-rays. Very often the first sign you get of a patient that retches is trying to put a bite wing in and that's when you find out they retch. So how can you get around that? You can't take panels as often as you can take bite wings, but we quite often use the lateral oblique view. The patient holds a cassette outside their mouth and we're able to get a reasonable view, not as good as bite wings, but it's an acceptable alternative. Impressions, and this is where working with your nurse is important. If you, especially with alginate, if you've got a nurse that can mix you up a good mix with warm water that goes in the mouth, sets and comes out very quickly, then you're much less likely to get the patient to retch. If you mix up with freezing cold water and it's in the patient's mouth a long time, you're more likely to get retching happening. And the third thing is suction tips suction tips, uh, you, your nurse needs to know where to put them and it's your responsibility as the dentist to make sure they, they know the areas to stay away from. So if uh, a patient does retch and eventually vomits, then it's not, good for the dental, it's not good for the dental team. You can get a delayed list, you can get an odor hanging in the air and the poor old nurse ends up cleaning up the bodily fluids. I've never known a dentist actually do that, it always seems to be the nurses that do. So it's really important to have a good team, a uh, good dental nurse on board with you. Um, they're a vital part of the treatment team. They need to be aware of where to put the suction tip. So you need to tell them, you know, don't, don't touch the sensitive areas that we mentioned earlier on. And let's look at some papers now. So when I qualified, Janet Fisk was the big guru on retching and there was a lot of uh, information out there. And then it seems to have died away a little bit. Um, many of the papers have got small numbers, um, and I suppose since the pandemic's happened, I've been a lot more cynical and critical about papers when I look at them. I think beforehand, I'll just accept what the paper said and not question it, but I think nowadays um, I'm more challenging when I look at papers. Many of the papers on retching have got small numbers, but there's a few of interest just upcoming. So this paper comes up a lot um, when you do searches on retching and gagging, and it's probably the most serious side of a slide I will show tonight. But you have to bear in mind that retching might be a sign of abuse. And this was quite a big study, 448 participants. And you can, you can read the uh, conclusion there below yourselves. But, you know, if you do have somebody that's a profound wretch that's possibly a young woman, you, then you need to bear in mind there might be other things going on. I'll just leave that there for a minute or two for you to have a look at. Okay, so we'll move on now. Phobias, greater dental care related fear and pain are related to higher incidence of gagging problems during dental treatment. There's a paper there that uh, discusses that. And this is the Van Houten paper. This paper was from Holland, big number, 11,000 participants. They found that 8% of their patients retched, mostly female or females more. A lower level of education was linked to retching and higher levels of dental anxiety and higher numbers of untreated cavities, gingival bleeding and full dentures. So it's fairly self-evident, I suppose, but a little bit counterintuitive is the last um, conclusion, which is there wasn't any less attendance. Greater dental care related to fear and pain are related to higher frequency of gagging problems during dental treatment, but they found that their patients still came. And that may be a cultural difference that going to the dentist in Holland is regarded in higher esteem than maybe Ireland or England. But uh, that was their conclusions, but that was a big study. So Janet Fisk invented the gagging severity index, which you can see there, and she graded gagging by four or well, sorry, five different types from normal gagging, which was very mild and occasional to fifth, which was very severe gagging, affecting patient behavior and dental attendance and making treatment impossible. 
And then if we look at the next study, this is the Halleck study, they used that, um, that index to predict uh, patients' uh, gagging intensity. And they also did a questionnaire, which I'll show you here. And it's on the right there, and it asks various questions about, do you have a gag reflex? How strong is it? Um, you grade it. Um, have you ever had a negative incident with gagging? Have you ever gagged at a dental or dentist office before? And then it discusses what procedures you've gagged with. And then there's a scoring survey on the left there, and the um, questionnaire is scored, and you get a turn the handle, you get a score, and um, you see the intensity of the patient's gag reflex. So their results, they say there was a moderate, moderate positive correlation between the predictive gagging survey and the Fisk and Dickinson gaggy severity index, which is the one we just looked at. But then in the conclusions, they say, um, we establish that this is a reliable and valid method to assess the strength of the patient or someone's gag reflex. So they're sort of jumping a little bit from a moderate, moderate positive correlation to a um, you know, very reliable and valid method. So you've got to be a bit careful when you read papers. Um, this Almos Nino et al., um, 54 patients with exaggerated gag reflex, DMFT and plaque index scores were high amongst patients with exaggerated gag reflex, which I, can, I guess is self-evident, but it's nice to have a paper to prove it. And pregnancy, if you get a, a young woman of childbearing age who hasn't gagged before, but has developed a gag reflex, you have to um, consider that, you know, it might be a sign of early pregnancy. And we'll just talk a little bit about babies. Um, that little baby there is now my 22 year old son. But um, the main reason babies gag are they are still learning to control the gag reflex. The reflex is further forward in the mouth than an adult. And they are learning to eat and don't have fully uh, oral motor control, so will be more likely to gag. And during my um, research for this presentation, I did talk to a consultant pediatrician. And she said to me, oh, that's interesting. You're doing something on gagging. She said, um, I think uh, it'd be interesting to find out if those patients who were gagging were bottle fed from a very early age and whether bottles introduced into the baby's mouth at a very early age, which then precipitated the gag reflex. So it's a hypothesis. It's not a research that's been proven, but she said it would be an interesting thing to investigate. So forcing the bottle into baby's mouth too young may be the origin of some gag reflexes. So treatment strategies. Um, can you just go in the chat box and tell me, are you following so far? Tick, put yup if you are or nope if you're not. And if you're not, maybe you can just give us a question as to why you're not. That would be useful just to get a little bit of feedback at this point. So is it, Ahmed, is there anything coming up on the chat boxes? I'll let you know, Neil. Um, at the moment, uh, no. Um, I, okay. I, I, I have a couple of yeses. Okay. <laughs> so we're we're still intently listening um okay. I'll let you know okay, if fine. <laughs> we'll carry on we'll carry on okay so as i said earlier it's a treatment strategy for wretches it's not an instant solution so um and the definition of the word strategy is a set of plans intended to achieve something over a long period and it accepts that there might be failures along the way and i think with a wretching patient you have to accept that you know you may think you've got on top of their retching for one course of treatment but then they come back six months later and you're back to square one and you've just got to rebuild it all back up again so we've got another poll we're just going to do here so um Ahmed if you'd like to conduct that for us and let's see what the answers are we'll do that now um there we go I got a couple of people saying the chat function is disabled. Apologies for that. I'm not sure why. Um, if that is the case, then with you, if you can please comment in the Q&A section, that would be wonderful. Nice. We have lots of answers coming through. I'll give everyone another minute or two. Okay. 
speak now or forever hold your peace. Right. Here you go, Neil. Okay. So there's a good spread there. Interesting to see the acupuncture hypnosis and another pharmaceutical intervention. And uh, there's some honest people there refer to someone else. At least I like the honesty there. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. We'll uh, we'll carry on then. Do I need to close that window? Uh, I will close it yeah. for you. Okay. Right. Let's talk about some treatment then. How are we going to how are we going to cope with these guys? So, just we. Sorry, Neil. Just there's just a couple of people as well saying that um, uh, they use a multiple of the above. Um, okay in the polls as well so you know okay. people have, are using iv uh iv sedation as well as inhalation or okay. acupuncture as well so yeah it's, it's a combination. multiple treatment modalities that, that's the yeah, maybe we should have put that in the uh, in the in the poll anyway okay so ahmed i'm um i've got a frozen screen at the minute all right, we'll see, we'll give it a minute because um, it might be just because of the poll that I okay. got rid of. Let's see. It's not changing, is it? No. Uh, do you want to just come out of it and come back in for a second, Neil, as in in terms of just the presentation? mode okay so help. stop not, like, stop you mean stop sharing and come back in okay yeah sure do that and see okay and i'll try and share the screen again you can't have a webinar without one technical difficulty <laughs> okay is that okay with you neil yeah let's just see treatment modalities no, it's still stuck. That's okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. So we're going to deal with complementary therapy modalities, non-pharmaceutical, local anesthesia, sedation, and general anesthesia. So let's start off with complementary dietary supplementation. So first one is ginger. And if you drink ginger tea before you have a treatment intervention, then there's a paper here, the effectiveness of ginger in the prevention of nausea and vomiting during pregnancy and chemotherapy. So they're claiming it's effective to drink your ginger tea beforehand. And there may be some truth in that. Uh, the next one is peppermint. And this was another one related to oncology, really. Um, the effects of peppermint oil on nausea, vomiting and retching in cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. So this one, peppermint oil is placed on the lips just ahead of the anterior nares around the nose. And the, the effect of the, the peppermint oil scent, I think, um, seems to have a soothing effect on the, uh, the retching reflex. And the final one is salt. Um, there was a lot of talk about salt in the last few years, but this paper actually is from 1988, that the effects of sodium chloride on the reduction of gag reflex, you just place some salt on the tongue and uh, apparently um, you get a good, uh, good cessation of the retroreflex. It's not a technique I've tried, but, uh, you know, it'd be interested to know anybody out there viewing tonight. Uh, if you've had an experience, let us know on the Q&A or on the chat box. Can I interrupt you there for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, Emma has put her hand up. I want to. I'm, I'm curious yeah, sure. if if she'd like to um to just uh give her opinion on something, um, and if so, she can just turn on her audio. Um, and alternatively, she can just put her opinion on the chat as well. Um, but. Also, we have a couple of people who were saying that acupressure is something that they... It's coming up. It's coming up. Also use. Okay, good. Good. They, they're, they're, they're getting ahead of us, aren't they? <laughs> um, perfect. Okay, well, that's... Is Emma uh, going to talk to us or not? Uh, well, it, 
Uh, yeah, I, I've given her permission. It might have been an accident. Um, okay. So she, Emma, if 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 you want to speak, you can just um, unmute. Otherwise, we can keep going. That's no problem. And actually, Catherine has also mentioned that she's used salt on the tongue when taking bite wings a few times, which has worked quite well for her for suppressing the patient's gag reflex. So excellent. Okay. Goodness. Yeah. Okay. We can we carry on then. Yeah. So um, non-invasive, non-pharmaceutical therapies, CBT. Uh, if you've been in the ISDH for a number of years, we, there was a kind of period about 2016, 17, when we did a lot of work on cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, there's the definition of it. It's a kind of talking therapy, um, which teaches you uh, coping skills for dealing with different problems and focuses on your thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes, and how they affect your feelings and actions. Um, there's a lot of stuff on CBT out there. There's a book there, Free Yourself from Emetophobia, uh, and there's some um, paper, there's a paper there, Time Intensive Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Specific ph Phobia of Vomiting. So it, it, there's a lot of work out there on CBT. Um, hypnosis, I, I did a hypnosis course years and years ago, and whilst I don't do hypnosis per se anymore. A lot of the stuff I learned is in my normal clinical techniques. So hypnosis is only useful, obviously, for cognitive patients. And in special care, we see a lot of patients who aren't cognitive. Um, it works well with patients for whom you have a great rapport. But with special care, and when I was in practice, I found I had a lot of hypnosis patients uh, and it worked well on them. But it's difficult to build that rapport with special care patients as much. And also hypnosis is quite time intensive, although there are some therapies and techniques in hypnosis which are designed to be shorter. Um, it is still quite intensive in terms of time. So that's hypnosis. Uh, we'll move on now to acupuncture. And there's case series there. There's only 20, 20 subjects, but I've done that some acupuncture training and, and I, I, I'm a believer. I think it works well. Um, the top left picture you can see the chin point that's cv24 and that's direct point to stop retching also the top of the head there you can see and that is generalized acupuncture points just to relieve stress and anxiety and this small study but it did show a significant reduction in the gag reflex and um, acupuncture this is the cv24 uh, point and um, this is where the it is going to probably <laughs> Be challenging so can we see the little video so this is uh, my colleague cat and there i am placing an acupuncture needle in her cv24 point uh, i think it'll replay again and that's just in the chin and that works really well for acupuncture in a lot of cases it's not not foolproof but it works well in most cases okay so now we need to go back to sharing the screen again so, Amit, if you could just stop the video, thank you. So that's the CV24 point. Um, there's a, oh, we, the free screen's frozen again, Amit, I think. That's all right. So maybe if we come out of it again, or maybe stop yeah. sharing, come out of it, yeah. um, it probably needs to warm up a little bit. Um, I'd be curious to see what different people's, um, the people who use acupuncture, I wonder what they use as their um, particular pressure point. Um, I've, I've, uh, I've fixed the chat issue, I believe. Um, so hopefully you can try and um, pop yeah. it in the chat um, box. Okay. Let's just see the presentation going back to life. It's uh, I'm stuck again, I think. Oh no, there we go. So there's another point that is P6 on the wrist. Um, that is that's the inside of my forearm, and that point is between the two tendons that supply the wrist. Uh, and interestingly, if any of you have been pregnant and you've had maternity bracelets, that's the like a bracelet with a hard plastic ball that presses on that point. Um, and it's used in pregnant ladies to stop uh, nausea and vomiting. So, you know, there's coming towards acupressure, which I will talk about. And I think it's the, we'll just talk about ear acupuncture next. There is a school of acupuncture that says that all the whole body can be encompassed in the ear. 
and there was a gagging point in the ear just there, just ahead of the tragus, which I've used occasionally, but I'd rather put it in CB24, I'm going to use it. And interestingly, seafarers, their use of earrings and studs to prevent seasickness may actually be putting those items through acupuncture points in the ear. There's a stud through somebody's ear. So complimentary acupressure. Now, if you type in acupuncture in Google these days, you get loads of acupressure um, information. It's not something I'm familiar with, but uh, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work out there. Many special care patients are needle phobic and the prospect of more needles makes it difficult to get consent to allow acupuncture. Um, so acupressure, it could be an option. Um, it's non-needle intervention by applying pressure to an acupuncture point. And if you're, you know, you've got a patient that retches, you're trying to take impressions, just if that's me pressing my thumb on point CV24. If you just push the um, that point and get the patient to apply pressure with their own hand when you're taking impressions, it can be quite a useful thing to do. Um, there are lots of papers about acupressure these days, but personally, I I prefer to use a needle. But uh, you know, there are people using acupressure. And if somebody's on this this forum, I'd love love to know how effective it is and do they find it works for them. Um, a couple of things. Catherine mentioned that um, she's only ever tried the chin, um, but it's worked well if only to distract the patient. And yeah. maybe that's where the role of acupressure comes in as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's just me chiming in my own opinion. And uh, Danny mentioned that this is good for seasickness. Um, so it's probably the same theory. I think she's probably meant referring to the, the bracelet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's this uh, P6 wrist point. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the whole acupuncture Eastern medicine thing, I found absolutely fascinating. But mm. if you're brought up with a completely scientific background, you sometimes find it difficult to get your head around it. But mm. I, it, I find it fascinating. It works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we uh, Sarah Louise as well also says she re routinely uses acupressure on okay. the chin when taking impressions. And um, by virtue of the fact that she uses it regularly, it means that it surely does work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, good. Well, uh, I think I need to do a bit more experimenting with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just talk about local anaesthetic. So um, when the tongue becomes stimulated it's by the touch of other senses, um, the stimulation goes up to the medulla oblongata and the brain and the signals uh, then come back to the mouth to contract and push up and cause gagging. So local anaesthetic... Um, it's your best tool, I think. Not for every procedure. Obviously, if you're going to take an impression, you probably don't want to give local. But if you're going to do some operative dentistry, then and the patient gags, local anaesthetic is invaluable. So in the lower jaw, if you look and remember where the lingual nerve is, it's just under the mucosa at the back of the mouth. Uh, make sure, if with the lower jaw, if you're giving an ID block, make sure some solution is deposited by the lingual nerve on your way in. OK, I was always taught to give an ID block to do it that way, but not everybody has been taught that way recently. Um, I do a lot of STA, single tooth anesthesia, but in gagging patients, I prefer to go for a lingual block or an ID block. And if, if you do a lingual um, block, you find that you don't really have a problem with gagging afterwards. And I'll talk a bit more about that when we talk about RA in a second. So. Upper jaw, it's the same principle. So give your normal local for your upper teeth, but not but give a lingual, but not ID block, just a little solution deposited under the mucosa by the lingual nerve. And frequently, if the patient retches and you're working on the upper jaw, just numb up the, the, the tongue, the anterior two thirds, and you'll find that you can work on the upper jaw and they don't retch. Nitrous oxide um, is very useful for gagging. Uh, particularly for impressions, for instance, where you might not want to give local. The uh, study here, the effect of various concentrations, 30 to 70% nitrous oxide used. Um, but interestingly, in this study, they say the stimulation of the inferior nerve block failed to produce a gag reflex, therefore they didn't need to use RA, which is exactly what I've just said on the previous slide, that if you, you, know, if you give an ID block and the lingual nerve is, is frozen, then basically you probably don't need to give RA, but RA is very good. And interestingly, we had, um, maybe somebody could tell us about this. Uh, we had a sedation training day in Northampton today. 
and the guy was talking about RA machines, and he said in Ireland your background parts per million for nitrous oxide is 50, but in the UK it's 100. So I, I don't know, can anybody verify that? So do you actually work with less background nitrous oxide than we do? But it'd be interesting to know if anybody can answer that, that question. Um, midazolam, midazolam is actually, as well as many other useful qualities, it is an anti-emetic and it will suppress retching. And so I'll just talk about a case report we had. Um, this was a, a man, 39-year-old man with mild learning disability who lost a filling in his upper right jaw. Um, he had a profound history of retching. So we decided to give him IV midazolam so we could examine what was going on and why he was getting pain. Um, he appeared to sedate well, and you know we could go in the mouth and look for a short time. We saw he got a lost filling, but then he started retching again. So the question we then had was, do you give more midazolam or do you give local? And we decided with him, we would give uh, a lingual block, even though it was an upper tooth. We gave the lingual block and there was no more retching. So with this case, we'd effectively um, use the sedation just to get our local in. And then when we explored the tooth, we found it was cracked and it had a vertical root fracture and it fell in half when we put it on the operating tray. So um, coming to the end now, but general anaesthetic is, I suppose, an admission that you're Sorry, treating. Emil. Uh, Sorry, can yeah. I just interrupt you on that previous case, if that's OK? Yeah. Um, the lingual nerve block, did you give that bilaterally or is it just on the right hand side? For this one, we just gave on one side, but I have given it bilaterally on occasion. Um, if you remember, we're only numbing up the anterior two thirds of the tongue and the trigeminal nerve is both sensory and motor. So, that you know, the posterior third of the tongue, there, there was a lot of motor innovation going into the back of the tongue. So I think there was always the theory that you were going to swallow the tongue if you numb both of it up. But I've given bilateral blocks on numerous times over the years. I've never really had a problem, but I prefer not to because it's uncomfortable for the patient and it's a weird feeling. But uh, you can. this guy, he just had it on one side. Yeah, that's a good point, Hamid. Good point. Thank you. And also just a couple of questions um, yeah, sure. that have come in. Um, you mentioned before the 70% nitrous to 30% oxygen. Is that too much? Uh, you try, Well, you titrate it to the patient response, don't you? Um, yeah, I, I, I would never... I would never give normally that high, but there has been the odd occasion where I have maybe just to get local in and then, you know, brought it back down to 30 or 40 afterwards, but it's not the optimum level. It's not um, the optimum, but you that can, was, right? that, that was That was quoting what the paper said, okay? They were using different things. And if somebody is a real profound wretcher, you might need to use more than you possibly normally do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions that I can ask at the end as well. So. Yeah. Okay. So go back to general anesthetic. I guess you're pretty much admitting that you've you, 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 your treatment strategies have been suboptimal and they haven't worked. But I got talking with our anaesthetist about retching on this presentation a couple of weeks ago, and he said, well, "That's really interesting." And uh, he started then talking about uh, awake intubations. And of course they do the reverse. They, they use lidocaine spray to numb up the whole of the back of the mouth so they can get their airway in. But of course you're opening up the, um, the whole area at the back of the mouth to uh, possibility of ingestion and aspiration of uh, contents into the lungs. So, you know, awake intubations are a very difficult process for a anaesthetist. So that's pretty much, um, the talk. I'm just going to give two takeout points. Local anesthetic suppression of the lingual nerve is a very effective treatment intervention for upper and lower jaw. Other modalities may have to be used to facilitate the uh, administration of LA. And the second one, be aware of the background issues. It may not just be a dental problem. So they're my takeout points. If you want to put in the chat um, any of your takeout points or questions, I'd be most grateful if you could do that. Uh, and I just say thank you for listening. And if you have any further questions or you want to email me, there's my email address and I'll happily answer an email. Neil, thank you very much. That was very, very insightful. And it covered a huge range of different techniques that we can use, either isolated or in combination with one or the other. Um, Siobhan has mentioned, just building on the previous question, that 50 is the limit in Ireland.
Okay, that's um, interesting. That's what to Ireland know. Um, has, um, and the I have one question here. The guys, feel free to. Uh, comment in the chat as well um, or in the Q&A um, if you have any questions. Um, I have a question from Hussein. Um, do you think uh, do you think that we as dentists are licensed to place um, acupuncture needles, for example, on the chin? There was talk in the UK of making it licensed, but I don't know whatever became of that. And I, th I think it's you've got to I, I can't really speak for Ireland, but I think in the UK you've got to be able to justify if you're doing it you've had appropriate training and experience you know i, I think um i would need to go back and look at that but i have not heard anything recently that they were trying to license it or anything like that mm -hmm. yeah um i, I suppose I, I i don't know about whether or not it's in the curriculum in in you know specialty training in in in, in Ireland we we, it, we there are courses available on acupuncture therapy um in the dental setting if that's of um any use to anyone um john has mentioned again building on the topic of um what percent to use for nitrous as he says too often i feel that we get stuck on uh not giving more than 50% nitrous. And as you mentioned, Neil, it's always dependent on patient needs and patient response. Mm -hmm. Monitoring the patient by both the dentist and the dental nurse is key. A very valid point. Um, and then Danny on that is, um, is 50% and 50 parts per million not two different things? Yes, well, uh, yeah, well, the, the 50 parts per million is the background level of nitrous oxide um, that's permissible if you've got a monitor. Um, and that's what I, that, that was the point I was making in the UK, it's 100 parts per million in, in the surgery and air, you know. Um, uh, but apparently in Ireland, it's half that. I was just interested to know whether that is the case. Somebody could verify that. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Neil. Um, and she also mentioned, Danny also mentioned that she uses the ac ac an akinosi block as well um, to give a bit of lingual anesthesia, which yeah, yeah, yeah. is a good idea. Valid, too. Valid, it's a valid technique. The akinosi block, you sort of go around the corner and give an ID, an ID block from the cheek side. Yeah. Um, and Niall Neeson has mentioned that um, his experience is keeping the patient sitting upright rather than lying supine can make a big difference as well. Mm. Yeah, I think probably that's psychosomatic. The patient feels more in yeah. control. That's very true. Um, I was mentioning to you, Neil, a little while ago, um, something that I use is a distraction technique, uh, quite simplified, but again, it's building on the whole psychosomatic um, aspect of the reflex, whereby I would ask or I would play a game of Simon Says with them in the middle of the impression making process. And I would ask them to raise their right leg or um, Simon says to raise their right leg. And then if they and then I say raise their left leg, if they raise their left leg. I give out to them <laughs> and I tell them you shouldn't have raised your left leg. It gets, it gets them thinking and um, distracted. I suppose that's, that's, that's what I do anyway. Um, and uh, John, John actually has mentioned just building on Danny's point, 50 parts per million is the occupational exposure level yeah. over an eight hour time weighted average. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, John. That's very accurate. Yeah. Presented, delivered to the patient. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Exactly. Um, a few other people have mentioned that they use distraction techniques as well, and also taking deep breaths um, are useful too. Um, yeah. I'll let you know if anything else comes along. I'm going to just bring up a slide here. One second. Sorry. It's, it's, I can put it up if you want, Ahmed. You want to yeah, talk? That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Neil. So I wait. I'll let you talk, and I'll. Uh, I just can't see it. Uh, oh yeah, perfect. If you can bring the whole thing up, that'd be great. Yeah. So we have. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for um, attending this webinar this evening. Um, I hope you learned something. I know I have. Um, Neil has very 
generously um, spent his evening and previous evenings preparing this webinar for us and um, enlightened us on all the different techniques that we can use and are, are available to us um, to try out. Um, our next webinar is on the 30th of March by Dr. Claire Curtin, um, and that is on dementia and dentistry. Um, the sign up link will be available next week. Um, so it'll be at eight o'clock again. And we have, we're happy to announce that the uh, ISDH conference uh, this summer is in Limerick. Uh, on the 8th and 9th of June um, and again further details will be announced very soon and it's in the Strand Hotel in Limerick um, so we look forward to um, everyone being there and then the last thing as well is um, we're proud to announce that the um, some of you might already know this, but the 2026 IADH Congress will be happening in Dublin, which is amazing news. Um, and we, it was a lot of work in the background to try and get this bid through um, by the organizing committee. And uh, they did very well to do so. Um, and they will continue to work um, from now until the date of the conference in 2026 to make sure it is one of the best and i'm sure it will be um and again um just provisionally have uh some space in your diary for that again it's it's not until a few years time but just to be excited for that i suppose um and let's see there's just a couple of people coming in there there's a huge amount of uh, well wishes and thanks to you, Neil, coming through. Um, again, thank you. And I'd, I'd just like to add, I got involved with the ISDH because I went to the conference in Limerick, I think it was back in 2014, and uh, it, it was just such good fun that I think I've been to every one you've held since. So I'd recommend it to anybody over the Irish Sea that thinking of wants to go to Ireland to a conference. It, it's good fun. Yeah, and there's lots of things to do there as well in Limerick and... Uh, yeah, it's 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 very much a social thing, and yeah, I I had the same feeling exactly as you, Neil, when I started a few years ago. Um, I I am not sure if Ewa Jans wants to mention something. She had her hand raised. Um, if you do, I've 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 uh, allowed you to speak. Um, you can just unmute yourself if you do wish to, to if you do wish to speak. Um, and Danny has linked an article that uh, everyone can see. Um, or the HSA um, uh, publication, and that is it. Lots and lots and lots of thank yous, um, and even thank you from Egypt. So um, it was a hit worldwide, Neil. Thank you very much. And my, fi my final words will be thank you to you, Ahmed, and thank you to Kim for facilitating. And I'll, I'll just say thank you to Raj in England as well for just give me a little bit of a, a hand uh, with some of the preparations. So thanks to all three of you. Thanks, Neil. And thanks to everyone who attended. And I hope to see everyone on the 30th of March for the next webinar. Take care and have a good evening. Okay.